The following program is a UNC Charlotte production. Welcome inside UNC Charlotte. First up in this edition, we're in studio with Chancellor Phil Dubois. With a new academic year underway, we get an update on the university's priorities and challenges for 2012 and 13. As applications continue to grow, and as those applications grow, we've gotten um, higher quality students and more diverse students from every part of the world. Then we move from academics to athletics. Inside UNC Charlotte's Ryan Rose speaks with coaches and players from both men's and women's soccer to preview the upcoming season. Plus, we'll visit with head football coach Brad Lambert and offensive coordinator Jeff Mullen to get updates on the completion of the Rose Football Center and the first football student athletes arriving on campus. We had to teach them, uh, you know, last week how to line up for stretch and teach them all the basics, so, but it's fun to finally be doing that. All this coming up inside UNC Charlotte. There's a buzz in the air here at North Carolina's Urban Research University. Students are back on campus, and classes are back in session. We sat down recently with Chancellor Phil Dubois following his convocation address to the university, talked a bit more about the priorities for the coming year. We've spent years building the institution and in the last several years trying to publicize it more broadly in the region, helping the city's leaders understand what an asset we are helping parents in the region understand the quality of the education here. And what you've seen, of course, is applications continue to grow, and as those applications grow, we've gotten um, higher quality students and more diverse students from every part of the world. We've had an out-of-state recruiting effort to complement the great work our folks do in-state. Uh, we've had um, some outstanding programs go national, like the Levine Scholars Program. And we've received some national publicity for things like Epic and football that I think have just brought, or brought us onto more screens or into more ears than ever before. So I think those all combine. And uh, it's been a great, great thing for us. This year, something very unusual happened, which was that all of the predicted uh, numbers we use, all of the uh, formulas we use to predict who's going to actually show up, you could throw out the window. We had 5% higher matriculation rates than normal in all categories of students and that translated into more than 500 additional students so it's going to be crowded on the streets of uh, UNC Charlotte for a few weeks. Faculty and staff will receive at least a 1.2 percent increase in pay that's the first raise we've had in four years. Uh, the state was able to release the repair and renovation money uh, they were able to fund about half of the enrollment growth and they made back about two-thirds of the cuts in student financial aid that, um, that were lost last year. So there are, there are a number of positive uh, trends. Uh, there are some real concerns out there. One is that the Medicaid issue is still not under control. Another is that we don't really have a sustainable plan for state-funded student financial aid. But the big one really has to do with national and international f uh, factors that are almost out of our control. Internationally, it's the Eurobank crisis and the question of what happens with debt in many of the uh, uh, European countries. And here in the United States, it's going to be what happens after the election during the lame duck Congress to see whether or not they deal with this issue of sequestration and the continuation of the Bush tax cuts. We have been constantly engaged in efficiency measures around here. Uh, several years ago, we established our call center because the volume of business was too great for our registrar and financial aid folks to handle. We consolidated our residency determination offices because that's a big, complex, time-consuming process. Uh, we took an entire look at our accounts payable process. We have um, put into electronic form all of our procurement activity. Uh, this year we have a major review of our information technology services and infrastructure uh, and we're looking, looking at other things like that. So we, we constantly do that, but there will come a time when you finally say, that's about all I can do. Interestingly enough, with now uh, reductions in state funding, student tuition at UNC Charlotte, tuition and fees, contribute about 40% of every dollar that we spend on the students. And so um, maybe luckily this year we have a little bit of a windfall because we have all those additional freshmen. 
I don't think people realize that the Morrill Act is now 150 years old, uh, signed by President Lincoln in 1862, and really a national commitment to the education of the working class. And uh, Justin Morrill had a vision, and so did President Lincoln, about making sure that we had a broadly educated citizenry that we would need to make it a functioning democracy but also something that would uh, make possible the scientific and technological development and industrial development of the country. That has been something that has served us very well and then it even accelerated after World War II when it was realized that the nation's research universities were capable of really not only building the national defense but then building the great infrastructure after the war. Uh, the last 20 years has seen a real um, withdrawal or pullback from that view. Part of it's been driven by financial realities. There simply are too many public needs out there uh, in K-12 education, in welfare, in medical costs, in prisons, so that there's been more competition for the public dollar. And higher education has always been one of the non-mandated or the discretionary parts of the federal government and the state budget. Uh, but there's also been a change in attitude, and I was trying to convey to our audience my concern about that, because it has always been seen as a public good to have public higher education. I'm a first-generation college student. My parents couldn't go to college after the war. Even though my father had the GI Bill, he had a young child. He had to go to work. He couldn't, he couldn't do it. Uh, but both my parents pressed my brother and I to get a higher education, and I obviously wouldn't be a university president without it. And I think there are a lot of people sitting in the audience who felt the same way. So the dialogue has changed, unfortunately. So a lot of people say, well, it's not so much a public good, it's a private good. It's the people who get the degrees who really benefit. And that's surely true, but it's also the case that people who get degrees have higher annual and lifetime incomes. They're more likely to be employed. Therefore, they're more likely to pay taxes and to contribute to the healthy state and national economy. They're more likely to be healthy. They're less likely to be on social welfare. They're less likely to commit crimes. They're more likely to vote, and they're more likely to, to be active philanthropically. So there are a huge range of public goods associated with public higher ed. And if that isn't maintained, the entire political structure, the political support structure for higher ed will go away. If the middle class and lower class citizens of this country don't feel that they can get into a university without going into a huge amount of debt, why should they vote for it? As a new academic year begins, so does a new season for Charlotte 49ers athletics. Coming up, inside UNC Charlotte's Ryan Rose speaks with coaches and players from both the men's and women's soccer teams to preview the upcoming season. But first, a talk with head football coach Brad Lambert and offensive coordinator Jeff Mullen. We are taking a closer look at Charlotte 49ers football and it's fun to say that. We're taking a closer look because there are players on campus and we have a team. It's not the team that we're going to field when the first kickoff happens in August of, of uh, next year, but Coach Brad Lambert and Jeff Mullen, our, uh, our offensive coordinator here and Let's talk about where, what stage we're on now. The guys are here. You've moved into your new facility. The, the main field is not quite done yet, but you do have practice facilities. What is the process now that players are here? I know you're not going to just jump right into pads and, and, and play yeah, ball. Yeah, Ryan, we, we've said all along we want to take, take about three weeks and, and go through a conditioning period that, that we're doing now. We're about midway through that. Uh, we've got the guys on the field, you know, trying to get them in shape. We've got them in the weight room teaching them all the lifts and things like that. And then Coach Mullen and the guys will, are also, you know, talking to them about our offense and our defense. So they're actually having some meetings with the guys and teaching them exactly how practice is going to run and what some of the plays are going to look like. And everything, you know, for us is we had to, we had to teach them, uh, you know, last week how to line up for stretch and teach them all the basics. So, but it's fun to finally be doing that. Right, to finally have guys to coach. Yeah. I mean, your coaches, that's what you want to be. Uh, doing at this point. All right, teaching, the, uh, installing the offense. I'm sure, y you know, you would usually rely on some of your upperclassmen to help with the terminology for the younger guys. Well, you got to teach the guys who will be veterans that terminology. 
a lot of film study, a lot of examples to the guys of what it's going to look like, Coach, as you start to, to kind of put this whole package together. Yeah, not only with the players, but with the staff that we hired as well. Leading mm -hmm. up to the kids getting on campus, we had to watch a lot of our previous tape and teach those guys what it is we want to do and what, what we want to look like on offense. And then certainly now with the kids on campus, trying to teach those guys what it should look like as well, you know, using practice tape and things like that once we get into practice. Now, I'm a football announcer. I've talked to you on the phone getting ready for games before, and I know as uh, teams head into that first game, the one thing coaches always say, we're just so glad we're not hitting each other anymore. Well, that's all you're going to do this fall and into the spring. I know, you know, sometimes tippers can get, we've seen it in NFL camps, you know, as they start getting ready for that first preseason game, they've been hitting each other for a month. How do you keep your team kind of united in the sense that, or, we're, gonna, we're not going to kill each other, guys. We've got to build it towards a, a team goal. No question, Ron. And I think that's the challenge for us and for me in particular to uh, make sure that we're spacing practice out. We're not going back-to-back -back every day. Okay. Uh, and we, we've got to take some breaks in there and let our coaches. We, we've got to go on the road recruiting. We're still recruiting uh, for next year's class. So we've got to break it up, keep it interesting. We've even you know, investigated some situations about going and practicing at different spots, you know, whether that's in Winston-Salem or another spot here in South Charlotte. Uh, we're looking into some things like that to keep it interesting for our team and to, and to you know, not run into that because essentially we're going to have three spring practices where normally you have one. And, and that's always an issue. Guys get tired of hitting each other. But we've got to keep it interesting and, and not do too much back-to-back. -back. Now, we got, we got a piece of the playbook here. There's a lot in this, and it's going to get bigger, I'm sure, as, as guys start to learn and things like that. But as the install happens, we're going to actually put it on the field in October. I know that you're wanting fans to come out and see these guys. What can we expect to see out of these teams by the time October hits uh, on those Saturdays when you want guys to come out and want fans to come out and kind of get a taste of it? What, do, what, do we, what, what should we watch for by that point? Well, we're still learning, truth be told. Mm -hmm. We've got kids on campus that we're trying to fit their, their skills to our system, uh, but we're still trying to figure that out. We want to be up uh, pace. We want to be you know, fast and, and play loose and shotgun and all that kind of stuff. But we've got to see what these kids can ex execute in practice until we get to that day. Is there going to be, are we going to see some guys playing that may not even be in that position the following year? Because I'm sure as you get to know these guys on the field, you may determine even as late as next spring or as late as next July, gosh, this linebacker would be much better on offense or a lineman switching sides. Or you may have a guy or two having to, have to fill, be a backup on the other side of the ball. Yeah, I think that was kind of our whole philosophy in recruiting these guys. We wanted versatile guys. We you know, we took, you know, a lot of quarterbacks knowing they're not going to play quarterback, but they're really good players. So there's going to be guys switch around and switch positions, uh, and we know that going in. Uh, we do have time to look at guys. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a recruiting sell for us was we think you're going to be this, but you're pretty versatile. You might end up playing this. So it'll give us a chance to, to look at guys at different positions, and this guy might fit better over here. And, and there'll be some guys, uh, you know, that walk on that, that are out there now that are walk-ons that are, you know, they're going to uh, end up, you know, raising some eyebrows and end up playing for us, you know. So they're guys that, you know, we didn't know much about him. He came in. He looks good here. Let's play him over there. And, and so fitting those pieces together is the trick this fall and, and next spring. Going to be fun to be a part of that first group that plays. I mean, I'm sure that's a huge selling point. I remember on signing day, the first guy to get his materials in was the first signee. I remember that being a big deal. We've advanced that into April. The 20th is when the last practice is the spring game. Do you hope that you have a much better sense at that point of, of where you're going to be come August of next year? Oh, yeah, I think we will. We'll have, uh, you know, because the trick in this recruiting class is going to be put some age on our team. Mm -hmm. uh, some of those kids will come in in January uh, at mid-year. So we're going to have a much better feel once we get to April 20th, our spring game. And hopefully it's a real good atmosphere for us. People will come out and watch us in the spring game, and our kids will be, you know, really excited about doing that. And we'll have a good feel for where we are you know, who our quarterback's going to be, things like that. So it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to work out good. Very excited about that. We encourage all the fans to come down. They said most practices are going to be open. If you want to yeah. see what's going on, come get a taste of it because it kicks off in August of 2013. Jeff Mullen, our offensive coordinator, and uh, head coach Brad Lambert, thanks, guys, for a little bit of time. We thanks, really Ryan. appreciate it. Thanks, appreciate Ryan. it. We've got more coming up. Men's soccer coming up next. We'll take a preview of the reigning national runners-up. That's coming up in just a moment.
is time to turn our attention to men's soccer, and we have a new man sitting in the chair to my left. After a long, exhaustive search to find a new head coach, we found out we already had uh, the guy who should lead this program, Kevin Langan. Back for your fourth year at Charlotte, but first time as the manager of this club. Uh, welcome to the to the head coach's chair. I'm sure it's been a fun short off season for you guys, as late as you played last year. Yeah. Um, let's let's dive into the, to last year just a second, and we introduce two of our seniors here, uh, Isaac Cowron and uh, Donnie Smith, two of the guys uh, actually a midfielder and a forward. So we got some guys up front. 21 career goals between the two of them, if my math is correct. Let's go back to last year. A um, couple of years in a row bounced out in PKs. You get all the way to the Connecticut game. I was watching that online here in my office and it's PKs. You play the, the, the full regulation, the right. two overtimes, PK time. No worries, right? Well, we prepared for that moment for months and months and months. You know, We sat down as a staff back in January um, and said, okay, enough's enough. No more losing playoff games and penalty kicks. What do we have to do now to get them ready for when it comes up? So. Um, we had a routine in place, the players all knew what it was, we practiced hundreds and hundreds of time, hundred times, we had put them in all kinds of scenarios, we had had people shouting at them um, at the end of a game, you know, if you have the punishments, if you lose, all kinds of stuff. So when it went to penalties, it was okay, relax, let's focus on a routine and let's get ready to take a good penalty. Because you can't guarantee you're going to win, you just can guarantee you're going to hit the target and do your stuff. Be consistent and then Absolutely. boom, you advance there, go to the, the College Cup, first match, Creighton penalty kicks again mm -hmm. you guys were ready tell me about that experience absolutely I mean like you said we did it thousands of times leading up to it and it wasn't you know just a couple weeks before it was months before we did it in the summer we did it in the spring before that and really it was just like another walk in the park as the saying goes so wasn't really much thought to it just do your routine put it in the back of net everybody answers it it was it just felt like another it wasn't didn't feel like the pressure of the match, which is exactly the point. Well, you train so hard that in the moment you just let it flow. So all the thought, all the step by step goes on way behind the scenes, and in the moment you just let it happen. Donnie, national championship match. You're in it. A lot yep. of media, a lot of circus, a lot of fans. Were you surprised at the number of Charlotte folks that made their way down to Alabama? You know, yeah, I was really surprised just because uh, exam week was coming up, but we managed to get, what, six or seven buses down there. And if you looked at the stadium, it was full of green and white. Didn't see much Carolina blue, and um, it was just honestly the most humbling experience I've ever been a part of. It's really I, cool. The post game was really cool. You guys thanking the fans, and, and we leave that feeling to into what is considered the off season. I'm going to tell you, I've been in college athletics for 15 years. I have never in my life seen a team work that hard out of season as these guys did. Mm -hmm. I was thoroughly impressed. Does that come from within the, the club? Do the guys, they, do they burn that fire and does that motivate yeah, them? Absolutely. I mean, I said it earlier when we were off camera that we look to recruit that type of player who's, you know, inner motivated, intrinsically motivated to do well. We go through the goals we set as a team and as individuals and they say what it is and it's our job to hold them accountable. So if these guys want to go and get drafted or we want to get back to where we were, then we've got to work real hard in a moment. So. It's, uh, it's comes from within the group as well. They push each other as well. So. Who are the ringleaders of all that hard work? You, is it the senior class or to a man everybody wants to be better? Um, I'd say, yeah, senior class if it takes the reins with it. And then you obviously have different individuals who, you know, really want to push themselves. Some guys want to be All-American. Some guys want to play MLS. Some want to go overseas. So you just kind of find your unique motivation and kind of push them that way. Pretty impressive stuff. Now let's talk about this season. Mm -hmm. um, to get back to that level, there are a whole lot of hurdles along the way. Each goal mm -hmm. has to be met. Uh, as we look at the schedule for this season, so mm -hmm. pretty good teams on there. A lot Absolutely. of tournament teams on your schedule this year. Yeah. You'll be tested early. Yeah. Well, I mean, first and foremost, that national championship game, we don't even talk about that. That's, sure. That's a dream. That's so far in the distance that it doesn't even come into our being at all. So, But going to the schedule, you know, we've got two real good, challenging exhibition games. And then if you look at our out-of-conference schedule, we have six teams who were in the tournament last year. So, wow. And that's what we do here. We always go after the best, want to play the best, and uh, try and keep our RPI high. Hopefully you've got to go on and do one of those games, obviously, first. But uh, no, we're excited. There's a lot of challenging, good, tough college games ahead, so we're excited. And then when we get to the conference, obviously there's where the familiarity comes in. Last year in the A-10, you guys are going to lead that charge. The tournament is back here at Transamerica <laughs> yeah. Field. Yeah. So senior day won't be your last home match. Most likely oh, yeah. to keep playing into that next week. Your thoughts, uh, Isaac, on the on the tournament being here again? Um, just kind of worked out to be a dream come true. Because I mean, your senior year, you want to be here at home in front of your own fans, and you want to be able to 
kiss and raise that trophy above your head a bunch of, in front of your family and friends and teammates and all that. So. And speaking, I know I asked you, Donnie, about the fans in, in Alabama. Yeah. How about that crowd that shows up at this place? It's unbelievable. You know, this place is, is rocking. I know Ike's been talking to a lot of the fans, working on different surprises we have in store. Uh oh. So uh, it's going to be real cool this upcoming season. Yes. A lot of, a lot of different surprises. Well, the, the atmosphere in the, in the tournament was outstanding, and mm -hmm. I'm hoping that that will translate into this regular season because you've got quite a few matches Absolutely. here at home that will need those guys for some energy. Uh, come uh, come September, October. Yeah, come, come out and support us. Yeah. yeah. Well, guys, uh, taking you right off the pitch, I know it's going to be a long way to get there, but uh, we wish you the best. Everyone's behind you. A lot of success last year that will hopefully the fan momentum will carry into this year. Good luck. Thank you. Here in this Thank last you. run through the A10, and best of health to you guys, and hopefully we'll Thanks see you so playing much. well back into December again. That should okay. be fun. Hopefully. Sounds like a plan. Head coach Kevin Langan and two of our seniors, Isaac Karn, and Donnie Smith, thanks guys for visiting with us. Well, that's gonna do it for our men's soccer segment. Stay with us, women's soccer is coming up next. Welcome back inside our broadcast communication studios inside the library at the center of the campus of UNC Charlotte. Ryan Rose with you as we take a closer look now at women's soccer. We've talked to football now, football and football. We get all of our football clubs in. Head coach John Cohen back for a fourth year. He's a senior now. <laughs> after after graduating, now four years as a head coach here. And and I didn't realize that Lacey McGowan was one of your recruits before you got hired on and you brought her here. She's a senior sitting with us here and junior Sarah Ann Wall also here. That's a kind of a cool story. You, you get someone that you build a relationship with. She trusts you. You trust her. You, I'm going somewhere else. Why don't you come play for me? Well, how, how did that come about? Absolutely. I agree with you. I mean, you know, obviously when you were looking for recruits at the Division Two level, you look at players who potentially you think in your own mind can play Division One. And so when the opportunity arose for me to get the position here at UNC Charlotte, obviously I was excited reached out to Lacey and her family. I thought, always thought of her as a very high player, good character, good qualities, and I'd love for her to get on the Division One level. So it worked out really well for me and her. You get, you get an offer from a D2, and all of a sudden you get an offer from a D1 from the same guy. That's got to be a nice summer. It was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely a um, new direction that I thought I was going, but very appreciative of it. And um, I know that being at Charlotte is definitely where I'm supposed to be, and I love it. Love, loved every minute I'm here. So. And being from Georgia, that puts you 30 minutes closer to home than you would be if you were up in Salisbury. That's true. Statesville is where Sarah Ann is from, so you're yeah. a, we would consider you a local kid, and yes. you've been here for now your third season. Mm -hmm. Now, you two are defenders on the team, and there's a lot of experience back there. Can you tell us about how uh, confident you guys are defensively coming into this season? Um, I'm very confident. Just um, based on what I've seen so far in preseason, everyone seemed to be working together. Um, just... It's, it's going to be a strong year back there, definitely. Now up front, we'll see some new faces. You graduated a lot of players, and, and uh, let's talk about some of the fresh faces coming in and some of the choices you're going to have coming up as the season gets going. Yeah, like you said, we've graduated a lot of uh, experienced players up front, so that's probably the part of the field that we've had the greatest turnover. So we've brought in a lot of young players to contend for those positions up front. We've also got a nice sophomore class that uh, had a good spring breakout. Um, so we're looking at... Some of our returners like Sarah Trexler, Dakota Olson, um, and obviously another senior, Kerry Dale, to contribute with the goals. But then there are other young players up front who are hopeful of big things. Alex Myers, uh, Tori Fabara, we're looking at uh, Katie Thomas. There's probably about nine players competing for those three spots. So that's one of those parts of preseason that's real competitive every day. Now, let's, as we look at the schedule for this year, it's you weren't given any any nod of favor on this schedule. Uh, we're going to see you guys a lot in September. Virtually six of your seven matches in September will be at Transamerica Field. Get your tickets now. Get online and uh, find out when they're playing. But then October hits, and then boom, five straight matches on the road before you get to finish with two at home. That is kind of one of these... <laughs> you need to build some momentum at home before you have to hit the road for quite a bit. Definitely, yeah. I mean, like you said, we have to get some momentum going into conference play. And we put a very good non-conference schedule together, um, bringing in the likes of Wake Forest last year's Final Four, Clemson, ACC. Um, you know, those kind of games will get us prepared for the conference. But 
Conference is going to be a tough one this year. It's our last year in the A10. Mm -hmm. We definitely want to leave a, a good landmark and a good statement. Um, we're hoping to go out on a very positive note. But we're playing virtually all the top teams besides ourselves in the conference and many of those on the road. So we've definitely got the challenge, but uh, there's no better way to finish your last year in the Atlantic 10 with playing the best that there are out there. And uh, we're excited. I mean, that road trip will say a lot about our season, but if we can come out of there with a really positive string of results. It sets us up nicely. Lacey, I know uh, it's no fun to finish on the road. Thankfully, you do get your last two matches your senior year at home, including Butler, who we don't really know that much about, haven't played them. So that's got to be kind of a neat thing to be able to have senior day at home in the last weekend of the regular season. It is, and you know that you always have um, familiar faces at home at that moment, and it just makes the whole day that much more just emotionally, um, I guess, fulfilling for you, mm -hmm. I think. So it'll be great. And I know Sarah Ann wants to make sure that the senior class gets sent off in style. Can, can you talk just a, a quick second about some of the home crowds that have come supported you guys over the years? Um, yeah, the, so far since I've been here, they've been great. Um, the best thing, there's no better thing than playing at home in front of your fans. Um, hearing them cheer you on um, in the late minutes of the game when you're exhausted, just their energy that they bring is just what keeps you going. And it's going to be a phenomenal way for the seniors this year to end their season here at home. And um, I know they're excited. We're excited for it, too. And a great place to play, of course, as, as you've been around the, the conference in the region, one of the nicer facilities to play in. And it keeps we keep adding to it every year. It keeps getting nicer and nicer. It's got to be a great place uh, to recruit and also to play matches. Oh, this is a fantastic place. Um, you know, the, the Transamerica Soccer Stadium, the new tennis facility, the football stadium. I think I think UNC Charlotte could host the Olympics. It looks that good. <laughs> <laughs> I think so, too. And, and he's got a point. I've been here seven years, and there aren't a whole lot of buildings that were here when I started. So... New construction, a lot of fun, and we expect to see you out at Transamerica Field as uh, the ladies uh, hit the pitch here in just a few weeks. And as I said, lots of matches in September, but don't forget about that those two at the end of October as we send them out and then push them on to Rhode Island for the conference tournament. Hopefully, maybe some more after that. Uh, hopefully, that's the plan this year. That'd John Cullen, thank you so much for dropping by. Thank you, Ryan. Looks like we grabbed them right off the pitch. They're, they're in full <laughs> uniform. We've got Lacey McGowan and Sarah Ann Waugh. Thank you, ladies. Good luck. Best thank of you. health. And have, have fun. Have fun this last year. That's what all it's all about. Thank you. You can check out all of the sports at charlotte49ers.com. We will see you out on the field or on the courts. Go Niners. Thanks for joining us once again. There's more on the university website and all of our segments are on YouTube. In the meantime, we look forward to seeing you next time here inside UNC Charlotte.